What's good YouTube? Welcome back. Thank you for clicking onto this reaction. I hope you're looking forward to it just as much as I am. If you haven't already, head over to the content creators page. That link is in the description box down below. If you haven't already and you're enjoying our content, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're gonna jump straight into this one. Manchuria, September 19th, 1931, 11.48 a.m. The sake is good. The hotel is comfortable. The mm. geisha is dancing. General. What happened there? General Tatekawa is enjoying himself. Who knew this last minute assignment to Manchuria would be so relaxing? <laughs> Yesterday, his boss is in the army ministry. He's not expecting what's about to come. Foot in Manchuria, a plot by insubordinate members of the Kwantung army to start a war with China. So Tatekawa had been rushed from Tokyo to Kwantung army headquarters in order to quash it. But when he got there, he told the leaders that his message from Tokyo could wait until tomorrow. After all, Tatakawa himself thought a war with China might not be so bad. He mm. could even recommend a good hotel. How so wrong he, he will be. Last night ...and carried on partying this morning. The geisha dances, the shamanson plays. The music nearly covers the sound of gunfire. The sound he's <laughs> pretending... <laughs> nearly covers the sound of gunfire. This episode of Extra History is brought oh, to we you have got one of our wonderful patrons over on Patreon. Thanks so much for your support. Nice. Dumb. Japan civilian government didn't take the Kwantung Army's invasion of Manchuria lying down. In truth, it was more like gradually reclining. The Prime Minister learned about the troop movements from the newspapers. He didn't know what to tell the ambassadors when they called, and the Kwantung Army was not responding to his messages, telling them to stop and asking for updates. <laughs> oh god could you imagine it if you're the prime minister and you're just trying to deal with this you don't know what's going on you're not being told and yet you've got to deal with the after effects of this all the time i'd quit i'd quit i wouldn't be dealing dealing with that you got you're taking the pee you're taking the absolute pee there's no way i'd be dealing with that who ordered this anyway <laughs> definitely wasn't going to tell the foreign leaders he couldn't control his own military. No. He contacted one of the grand men of state, the last of the oligarchs. To the last thing you do is tell the other states that you can't control your military. That just makes them petrified of you. Try to get him to lobby someone, perhaps the emperor. No response. But this undeclared war was getting bigger. China had 200,000 troops in Manchuria, and the Kwantung army was no match for that. So within days, generals ordered Japanese reinforcements in Korea to cross into Manchuria. Soon the government assented to sending more troops from Japan itself. And there was another problem. The public loved it. Mm. War fever entered full swing. People started wearing kimono liners printed with tanks and fighter aircraft and flocked to cinemas to see newsreels of the combat. As far as the public was concerned, Japan was finally taking an active hand. After all, a lot of Japanese soldiers had died in World War One and the Russo-Japanese War to gain possessions in Manchuria. At which they didn't get, right? To them, a graveyard of heroes. Mm. Further propaganda, much of it laid by the military, positioned Manchuria's natural resources as necessary to Japan's economy. Though modern scholarship has suggested this was never the case. After all, who do you think was making all those newsreels everyone was watching? <laughs> the army. Anyone who stood against the war was punished. Newspapers that criticized the Kwantung army were subject to low sales or boycotts. Mm -hmm. Politicians took note and felt like they could do nothing. But it wasn't just public. Well, I mean, the politicians could do nothing, let's be honest. They had no chance. It's absolutely crazy. It reminds me of the kings of Romania who heard of us entering the World War II against the Soviets for the first... Uh, from the radio yeah i'd imagine that would absolutely petrify you as well if you was a part of the soviet union at the time and they declared a uh, war so you had to be involved you would just be absolutely outraged uh, if you found out over the va radio it's a good point dz public opinion they were afraid of in october of 1931 less than a month into the war Young officers informed their superiors that members of the Cherry Blossom Society had concocted another plot to overthrow the government. They would take command of a group of aircraft and bomb the Prime Minister's cabinet meeting, decapitating mm. the civilian government. Then, a troop uprising would capture government buildings and they'd force the Emperor, at gunpoint if necessary, to take power. Generals arrested the plotters and gave their ringleader the harsh punishment of 20 days house arrest. <laughs> 
<laughs> 20 days house arrest. This is his, uh, who was this, sorry? Was this the leader of the army? He, here, here, um, can't remember his name. Government. Then a troop uprising would capture government buildings and they'd force the emperor at gunpoint if necessary to take power. Generals arrested the plotters and oh no, this this is someone completely different. Gave their ringleader the harsh punishment of. Oh, it's just a random ring. It was just a random ringleader. Arrest. Yeah, many other officers got ten days, while some were merely transferred. It was mostly <laughs> quiet, treated like an internal matter. <laughs> it's not a big deterrent, right? Well, <laughs> no, you're just gonna try it again. That was part of the problem. As we discussed last episode, there was a hesitation to punish these types of actions, mm -hmm. partially because this was just a more extreme version of the nationalist message the government itself pushed, but also because these acts were seen as gaikokujo. A sort of that when things are wrong in Japan, idealistic men will sometimes do rash, rebellious, and self-sacrificial things to try to put things right. You know, like murder a politician or invade a country. And that while these actions were not exactly kosher, they still should be admired. Because they're trying to do it for the emperor and for the state of Japan, now, right? At one time, historians tried to explain this reactionary violence and the public excusing it entirely through the lens of Japanese culture. But there are other factors. For example, Japan's public education system, where most students dropped off after sixth grade and even more after eighth. Only a few fully graduated and even fewer went to college. Any reason for that? What was the reason for them not finishing uh, sixth grade at the very least? Meaning in the troubled 1920s and 30s, most of the public lacked the tools to understand the complicated web of political, diplomatic, and economic forces mm -hmm. now shaping their lives. And in the absence of that understanding, many people turned to conspiracy theories to explain their world and supported extreme, often violent solutions to fix it. Is that like today? Is that light today? February 1932, Tokyo. This is their motto. One man, one kill. Mm. Nisho Inoue teaches an unusual creed. Combining Buddhist thought with Japanese nationalism, he urges the complete overthrow of the modern political and economic order. As a young man, he drifted until ending up in Manchuria, working on the railroad and as a paid informant for the military. There, he says he okay. had mystical experiences, telling him that Japan must be renewed. He's drawn up a list of 20 names, liberal politicians, moderates, heads of corporations, and 20 volunteers. Some civilian radicals, others naval officers, come forward to receive their assignments, along with the gift of a Browning automatic pistol. So each one of them have one man to kill, I'm assuming. They take a blood oath to fulfill their duty, which is why the press will come to call them the League of Blood. Mm. February 9th. A former finance minister and major player in the liberal Minzato party steps out of his car to give a speech at a school. A league member guns him down. March 5th, the director general of Mitsui Bank is walking into the building when a league member draws a pistol and murders him. After their arrests, neither... After the second one, do you get start getting scared as a politician? I think I would. Assassin is quiet about who directed him. Nishio <clears throat> Inoue turns himself into a Tokyo police station six days later. But despite his imprisonment, naval officers associated with the group are planning something even mm. May 15th. In his residence, Prime Minister Inokai Chuyashi is worried. His predecessor had to resign over a failure to control the military. I mean, I would have just wanted to be quit. I would, I would have just wanted to quit anyway. There's no way if my army isn't listening to me, am I even going to attempt to put my name next to that? They start going off the leash and I can't control them. I'm not associated with this. I'm stepping down. Do not involve me in whatever decision is being made right now, um, for sure. Religion, nationalism, national. Why cannot I not speak today? Nationalism can sometimes merge and have disastrous consequences. I do and agree, DZ. Him to restrain the militarists. Nothing Inokai says seems to stop them. Plus, in January, the military had attacked Shanghai, China's largest city, over a deeply shoddy pretext. And the the military at this point was there was no control of them. The dogs were off the leashes. When he tried to negotiate a solution with the Chinese. He'd gotten called a traitor for it. Mm. Now the Army had declared a new Japanese puppet state in Manchuria, Manchuko. 
and invited the deposed Chinese emperor to rule it. Inokai refused to recognize its legitimacy. Suddenly, outside the door, there's a scuffle. Shout. Wait, so the prime minister was saying, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. Military, you're being way too much here. We can't say that is a real state of Japan. And then as that happens, he's got some knock on the doors. 11 naval officers. You'd be shitting your pants. They're young, no more than 20, and carrying pistols. If we could just talk, Inukai says, I could make you understand. The mm. gun. dialogue is useless. They open fire. Like Inoue's League of Blood assassins, they're caught immediately. But yeah. that's the plan. They don't care. They, 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 they knew they were going to get caught. They didn't care. Because both groups will use their own trials as propaganda. It's a media circus. When the judge tries to decide the case against Inoue and his two assassins based on facts, they whip up a publicity campaign, saying he's secretly a communist sympathizer with anti-Japanese views. No way. And it's going to work because propaganda can convince people of anything. Badgered in the press and mentally exhausted, the judge declares himself unfit and gives up the case. The new judge, a right-wing admirer of hmm. Inoue, lets him use the trial as a platform to spread his message to all of Japan. Of course. He allows Buddhist clergy allied with Inoue to testify that his actions with the League of Blood were spiritually pure and patriotic. Mm. As soon as it, the judge publicly states that he regrets having to give them life in prison and suggests the emperor might give them amnesty. The trial of Inukai's assassins is even more fevered. 110,000 people write or sign letters in their own blood saying the defendants should be released. Nine young men offer to die instead of the plotters and show their commitment by sending their severed little fingers to the court. Oh my god! The commitment of the Japanese people are uh, just something else, man. Something else. The judge, intimidated by what happened at the League of Blood trial, lets the killers expound on their motives. Comments the newspapers then print and disseminate verbatim without comment. Just Military all of that reports, propaganda. The are charged not with murder, but rebellion. Defense attorneys argue that loyalty to the emperor is the basis of the law, and given their pure motives, to punish them harshly would undermine the emperor and Japanese. Mm. A navy prosecutor. What a massive loophole within the system. Isn't buying it. He goes after them hard, argues for the death penalty. After all, he says, motives shouldn't matter. Murder is murder. Yeah. And if the court doesn't punish these men, it will only encourage more political violence. And he, he's a hundred percent right. He was right. Because yeah. the naval courts didn't listen. It gave the assassins only fifteen years in prison, and the prosecutor, by contrast, was forced under public pressure to resign from the navy. It was, as one British reporter said, a case of government by assassination. And it wasn't over, not by a long shot. Wow, it definitely wasn't over, was it? Wow. Crazy, absolutely crazy what happened and the ferocity and the...